You've probably heard me talking about this self-sufficient living skills bundle that's been going on, and I have been spending the last week flipping through so many of the incredible resources within this bundle. Now, I will say there's a lot. There's over 118 different ebooks and courses and lessons sharing incredible wisdom and knowledge with you, so you can live off the land and you don't have to rely on this corrupt and broken system for everything for your family. Anyways, I wanted to share some of my favorite things. One, first off, is off-grid homeopathy. This course is loaded with so much incredible knowledge, talking about homeopathy for first aid, for colds and flu, how to make your own homeopathic remedies. Like, as an herbalist who loves to teach that stuff, that's pretty exciting to hear it in the homeopathy realm. There's also some incredible fermentation guides, so many other amazing herbal recipes and food recipes and how to make your own sourdough bread, how to do your own organic gardening and canning of all of your foods. Really, there is so much. And yes, I know, I know. I've talked about it a ton, but this entire bundle is only $50 right now until Sunday, March 24th. I'm sharing my herbal first aid skills, which is a course that's $47 on its own. I'm sharing recipes that I used when I got my products into REI for herbal first aid kits and so much more. Y'all have to check it out. I'm serious. Like you can absolutely change your life with this bundle. So there is a link in the show notes for you and I hope you check it out. I hope you take advantage. Don't worry. You don't have to go through everything right away. You can access everything for up to a year. Once you're in the course or have the download, it's yours for life. It is a steal of a deal. Okay, self-sufficient living skills bundle in the links for you. Hello and welcome to The Herbalist Path, a podcast where you'll discover how to make your own herbal remedies at home so that you can take better care of yourself, better care of your family, and better care of our planet. I'm Mel. I'm a clinical herbalist, environmental educator, and mountain living mama with this crazy passion for teaching more mamas and their little loves how to use plants as medicine in a safe, effective, and tasty way so that there can be an herbalist in every home again. It's an absolute honor to have you on the journey down the herbalist path with me so that together we can make herbalism Hashtag spread like wildflowers. Welcome back to another episode on the Herbalist Path. I am really thrilled to have today's guest, Lo Nigrash, because I was on her podcast, The Milk Making Minutes, and she is a lactation consultant. So I know a lot of you mamas listening out there may be breastfeeding and may have a lot of questions in the realm of how to do that in the best way and how to nurture and nourish your baby while breastfeeding and not to forget about nourishing and nurturing yourself. So Lo, thank you so much for coming on to my show. I am so happy to be here and your episode hasn't released yet, but it will really soon. And your story was just fantastic. And so I can't wait to share that with the world. Yeah. Awesome. That's so exciting. So I was actually just checking out your website a bit and Mm. I saw that you played volleyball without being able to volleyball in a wheelchair, basically. No, it's not a wheelchair. Actually, we sit on the floor. Wow. Tell me more. (laughs) Yeah. So I am a disabled athlete. I was born without my left foot. So I have a congenital amputation and I always played able-bodied sports my whole life. But when I was in my twenties, I was recruited to play for the Paralympic sitting volleyball team. And I had no idea about the Paralympics. I wasn't interested, but somebody said, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're rejecting. Just go to a tryout. I did. I could not even move after the first tryout. It was so hard. And I realized, okay, this is big time. And I joined the first 
women's national sitting volleyball team. It was just being established. And I played from 2003 to 2006. And it was the first year that women's sitting volleyball was in the Paralympics in 2004 in Athens. And we won a bronze medal. We were not expected to win any medal in 2004. We had actually just gone to a, uh, a friendly international tournament in Europe in uh, June of that year. And we lost every set of every match. We didn't win a single set. It's best three out of five internationally. And everybody was like, they're good. They're going to win something in 2008, but they're not going to win anything in 2004. And we came to Athens ready to prove everybody wrong. And we won a bronze medal in 2004. That is such a cool story. I, I love the sport of volleyball and played when I was a kid a lot. So hearing that is amazing that you got to do that in the Paralympics. And I'm just trying to visualize sitting volleyball, you know, like I did so much diving and using those knee pads as a kid. And uh... you do a lot of diving. There's a ton of movement. And actually, we used to play against the standing Olympic team a couple times a year as just a fun kind of event and we could beat them in sitting volleyball, not because our volleyball skills were better, but because our movement was better. They would get stuck and it's a lot of core as you're yeah. trying to move around on the court. You can even get up and run and chase the ball as long as by the time you are touching the ball somewhere between your shoulder and your hip is on the ground. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that, so, that sounds so cool. Now I've got to yeah. go like look it up and watch oh, some you games on up. YouTube. Yeah, you should look it up. The, some of my former teammates were really young when we started, like in their teens. And so they are still competing to this day. Yeah. And at the last Paralympic Games, they finally, after all these years, won the gold medal. They had not won gold after all these years. And finally, at these last games. Day. What an epic and empowering yeah. experience. That's so exciting. And to go to yeah. Greece too. Like, yeah, I yeah. love that area of the world. And yeah. I've only been to Croatia and that's kind of where some of my ancestors are from, but I went there like on a solo backpacking trip. Oh, amazing. 15 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And so gorgeous. My goodness. I can't wait to get my family back there. So oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Of I just, course. I just I read it. With the topic, but <laughs> no, not at all, but it has everything to do with you, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have stories, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's super fun. So let's let's talk about lactation and yes. nursing and supporting moms. And how did you get into becoming a lactation consultant? And and in that, what do you do as a lactation consultant? Yeah. So I always say that I find that people come to the field of lactation either through their own blissful experiences or through their own experiences of struggle. Mm -hmm. And mine was the second one of those. <laughs> um, I had tons of struggle with my first child who is nine and a half. And I breastfed him for three and a half years However, the pain never ended. And I saw every lactation consultant you could imagine. I went to doctors who were also IBCLCs. He had four tongue tie procedures. I saw craniosacral therapists. I, I did all the work you could imagine. And it just never resolved. And even everything that I know now, looking back on my story, I'm not sure that I could have done anything differently to, mm. to change the situation. And so I really empathize with those people who are struggling and need to make a different choice. And I always tell people, I knew the right choice for me was to continue going despite the struggle, but I never expect that for anybody else because every single person, uh, it, their mental health is reliant on very different factors. And so for me, my mental, mental health was better served by continuing to breastfeed. But for other people, their mental health is better served by making a different choice for their family. And so mm -hmm. I came to the field of lactation through my own struggle. And then I had a second child um, 
uh, who is now five and she breastfed until she was uh, four and a half. And thankfully, because my biggest fear with my second, having my second child was that I was going to repeat that story because by that Mm. time I was already obsessed with lactation, already on the path towards becoming an IBCLC. And uh, luckily I, the story did not repeat. Um, that's good. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a lot of years in a row of, right. of being in pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to hear a little bit more about the pain you were going through. I was really fortunate that I, I didn't deal with that when I was breastfeeding and I went almost three years with my daughter. Um, but just in case any moms are listening and they're like, oh, wait, I experienced that or that's what I'm feeling right now or something along those lines. Yeah. So typically pain is as a result of something being off with the latch Mm. and the latch can be off for a variety of reasons. Um, Most often it's because there is not enough mammary tissue in the baby's mouth. Well, it's always because there's not enough mammary tissue in the baby's mouth, but that can be for a variety of reasons. And so that's when you asked, what do IBCLCs do? We help with a wide variety of things, prenatal education. I do one-on-one consults prenatally, and that is covered by insurance. Uh, So I think it's really great if you can do a one-on-one consult prenatally, because then you can work with somebody who is specifically talking to you about what are your birth preferences? What are your feeding preferences? What are you hoping to accomplish? What's your plan about going back to work? Um, What are your thoughts about using a pacifier? And then you can create plans based on what your ideas are. And I like to treat my clients as if they are the experts on their body and they are the experts on their baby. And I think a lot of times we go to professionals and they take that expertise away from us or they make us feel like we don't know what we're talking about. Mm. And, you know, when our power gets chipped away from us like that, we start to feel like, oh, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe I do need to to give my power away again and again to other people. Um, and we start to kind of feel like we can't trust our instincts when it comes to mothering our children. Um, but at the same time, we can consult people. We can consult an herbalist about ways that we can improve our lives through herbs. We can consult a lactation consultant who knows, truly understands the physiology of milk production. Um, And so, you know, it's important to use people and consult them while at the same time going to people who trust us to make the right decisions for our families. Yeah, I I hear you use that word empowerment or and the word power. I'm sorry, and and it's so true that more often than not, in a lot of our healthcare systems, we are stripped of that power. And as mothers, as women, and yes, I'm sure men have this too. But speaking as a mother and a woman, we do have that innate sense, those gut instincts that are so unbelievably wise, yet we have been trained or forced into these systems that teach us to not trust them, to suppress those feelings, to suppress that inner wisdom and knowing. And in that, like you just said, reaching out to a consultant that is an expert in lactation or in herbalism or whatever you may be needing to deal with really enhances that sense of power because they can help you not dive down the rabbit hole of dreaded research and oftentimes, right. which becomes a big world of fear and right, exactly. more of that. Let me strip the power away from you. You know, where right. you go. That's why these people are experts. So right. I like to always remind my clients, okay, who is it that you're talking to? What is it that they, that they know and that they're really good at? And what is it that they don't know and that they might not be good at? So like, Pediatricians, they are a part of the care team. Mm -hmm. They are really good at certain things. They are not very good at breastfeeding. Right. (laughs) They only have a couple of hours, a few hours of breastfeeding education. And yet 
they don't know that they're not good at it. So they often give lots of breastfeeding advice. Um, yet they really aren't experts. They are just, it's just like asking your aunt for breastfeeding information. She might have breastfed a baby. She might have read some articles about it. Um, but she is not an expert and neither is your pediatrician. However, your pediatrician is an expert on quite a lot of things. And they're going to be on your care team from the moment your baby is born until your baby is 18. So they have a breadth of knowledge that a lactation consultant whose expertise is really in, uh, is, is much deeper, but more specific um, doesn't have. And so that's why it's really important to have a variety of people on your team. Hey, I wanted to take a quick pause to show some love and gratitude to our sponsors of the Herbalist Path podcast, who make this show possible for me and possible for you too. So here it goes. Medicinal mushrooms are all the rage these days, if you didn't know already. And with great reason, because they are powerful medicine that can improve your health and your life in so many different ways when they're well made. Yeah, it's true. There's a lot of stuff on the market that isn't going to be so effective. And that's why you need to find a brand that you can actually trust. For me, that brand is Whole Sun Wellness. And this is the creation of a brilliant woman and fellow mama, Jamie Bonfiglio. She's an international mushroom educator that has been working in the medicinal mushroom industry for years. And this is when she saw firsthand how many other companies take shortcuts when it comes to their products. And Jamie wasn't having it. She set out to build her company the right way. Whole Sun Wellness is here to raise the industry standards so those crap mushrooms on the market aren't getting into your body or your family's body. Whole Sun Wellness is the first company to test and report nutritional facts for all of their extracts. They go beyond industry standards every step of the way, from sourcing to extraction and final testing. And as the owners of the largest medicinal mushroom farm in the United States, Whole Sun Wellness is taking control of their supply chain for the highest quality and absolute full transparency. They're even the first company to include pure mycelium extract in every single product. So when you're thinking of getting medicinal mushrooms for you and your family, Whole Sun Wellness is exactly the ones you want. Also, be sure to check out their new Mycolites. These are the world's first dissolvable electrolyte tablets. They're featuring functional mushroom extracts that'll give you more energy, more stamina, and recovery as well. And who couldn't use all of that? The other thing is, they are these adorable little mushroom-shaped tablets, and they come in like a little Altoids box, but way cooler than Altoids because they're Mycolites. Anyways, head to wholesunwellness.com to grab yourself some Mycolites and all of the other functional medicinal mushrooms that you and your family need. And of course, you can grab that link right here in the show notes now. Absolutely. I actually just yesterday did a post on like how beautiful it is to see more Western medicine practitioners and more a holistic healthcare practitioners from my perspective, herbalism, and watching them begin to dance together a bit more. Yeah. And for myself, like as a clinical herbalist, I certainly will refer people out to people in the Western medical field or work with doctors to help them discover what would be the best herbs for that particular person or situation because they're not trained in that realm, you know? So right. yeah, bringing exactly. that whole thing together is so important. My nine and almost 10 year old is trying to see what we're doing, but I'm in the middle of an interview, love. Can you go do what you got to do? I love you. <laughs> I know you're too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're a homeschool mom too, right? Yes. Uh huh. 
<laughs> yeah, let's let's we'll come back to lactation and all of that wonderful stuff. Talk to me up for a moment about being a homeschool mom and having an almost 10 year old. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, my kids are almost 10 and almost six and we do homeschool. Uh, I've done that from the very beginning. Uh, and we, because I am also a working parent, we, we do do a variety of programs. So my kids do some forest schools a couple of days a week, and then I incorporate some screens. So like right now my kids are on screens and, um, I find it's all about balance. So this morning, the first thing we did was meet some friends for a, a walk in the forest and we did that. And then I did some reading practice with my daughter, did some math practice with my son, made sure they were well fed and we connected. And then now they're on screens while I do this. And so it's, it's all about balance for me. I don't think just like the Western medicine and the, the herbalism and incorporating lactation for me, it's all about what can I do for my family? That's best for all of us. And so if I were just focusing on homeschooling all the time, Maybe that would be best for my children, but it wouldn't be best for me because then my passions wouldn't be ignited. And I find that this is the same with lactation. Sometimes we focus so much on what is best for my baby that we forget that it's about a dyad. It's about a baby and the parent feeding the baby. Mm. Um, most often these parents are identifying as mothers. So the, the baby and the mother and we forget that, no, whatever the plan is, has to be good for both the mom and the baby. And Amen to that. Let's yeah. definitely dive into that. Because if mom is overly stressed and unable to handle that, that is directly that energy is going into your baby. And exactly. they are feeling that, which is going to cause more crying and cause more stress and cause more struggle and challenge. And it really kind of becomes a vicious cycle that mm -hmm. can be hard to get out of. So what can a mom do when she's in that time of breastfeeding? And if she's having really great struggles to support herself? Yeah. So the first thing, and I know this is biased, but the first thing that I would say is find support, whether mm -hmm. that is a friend who not the friend who's going to say, just quit or the friend who's going to say, just do what I did, but the friend who is going to really help you ground yourself to say, how can I help you? What do you need right now? Do you need advice? Do you need me just to listen? Do you need me to bring a meal over? You know, do you need me to find some support groups for you? So, so whether it's a friend, whether it's a support group or whether it's a professional like me and IBCLC, and a lot of people don't know. So they, they know that there are IBCLCs in a hospital setting, but they don't know that there are private practice IBCLCs, which is what I am. Really quickly, you say IBCLC a lot. What is that? Mm -hmm. That is an internationally board certified lactation consultant. So awesome. it's really considered the gold standard of lactation care. So in order for me to become, and I was a CLC before I was an internationally board certified lactation consultant and a CLC is a certified lactation counselor. And so the scope is broader. And in order for me to become an IBCLC, I had to um, have 95 hours of lactation specific training, 14 science, uh, college level science credits that included nutrition, some anthropology courses, um, uh, biology, economics, some courses like that, um, mm -hmm. statistics so that we can read and understand studies. And then, um, 1000 clinical hours. And then after you meet all of those um, standards, my kids are going outside and they're going to need the dog who's in here. <laughs> hey, Charlie, he's in here. You can let him out. He's in here. You can let him out. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Full on understand mom life, homeschool mom life. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. So then after you meet all of those requirements, then you apply to sit for a board exam. Mm -hmm. um, and then the board exam, it's an international board exam. It takes, you know, four hours to complete. It covers everything from pharmacology to um, the hormones of human milk production to counseling skills. It's very wide ranging. And once you pass that exam, then you get your IBCLC. And so that is really who you should be seeking out if you are having breastfeeding struggles that you can't resolve. Awesome. Awesome. So I, I just wanted to get that out there. And what a great explanation and diving deep into what it actually takes. It's not just some fluffy stuff out there. It's no, real deal. Right. Yeah. Um, it took would... me nine years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And that wasn't like nine years of like going straight because right. mom, lives, mom. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, that is amazing, amazing work that you do. And we, we were also still touching on what these moms can do to support themselves, reaching out to a friend, reaching out to a consultant. Um, what other things do you, when you are working with somebody and you're like, you're really struggling, let's make sure that you are okay as a whole person, mind, body, soul. Yeah. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to, I want to check in and see like, why, why, what's your why? Yeah. The so, root. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you feeling pressure to continue breastfeeding in this way? Um, do you need to step back and take a break? So do you want to express some milk um, and feed it in a bottle while we try to resolve your breastfeeding issues? How can I help you to feel good and make the next right step? Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes like in my situation, I was feeling no external pressure. In fact, I was getting a lot of pressure to quit. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't want to quit. I wanted to continue. And so I recognize both sides of that, that sometimes we get pressure from both sides. And so really digging in to say, what is it that you want mm -hmm. and what is it that you want long-term and what can we do short-term to help you feel better right now? Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe it is just taking a break for like a day or two while you wrap your mind around what your next steps are. Or maybe it's feeding on just one side while you let the other side heal. There's lots of ways that you can try to resolve your difficulties um, and still can keep up your milk supply that are thinking a little bit outside the box. But sometimes you need somebody who's not in it and experiencing the, the emotion that comes with milk supply to help you come to those solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That outside perspective, especially when you are in that, those first few years of motherhood, when you are a whole new person with a whole new identity, and you are now responsible for a human, and you feed this human from your body, if all goes as you desire. Um there's so much change there happening and, you know, postpartum depression can definitely be a factor and all of the struggles that we have. I know when I was a new mother, I would dive into all of the research all of the time. And sometimes I'd just have to be like, that makes no sense or this does make sense. And like navigating that gets really, really challenging um it's part of why i do what i do to help moms you know so when you are working with these moms i also think a lot about their mental health um as a lactation consultant how can moms support themselves mentally because that is such a challenge for so many I wanted to take a quick pause to show some love and gratitude to our sponsors of the Herbalist Path podcast, who make this show possible for me and possible for you too. So here it goes. 
love this time of year. It's spring, the sun is shining, and all of our beautiful plant friends are popping up. It's amazing. Unless, of course, you're one of the millions of people who suffer from seasonal allergies. You know, the itchy, watery eyes, the sneezing and wheezing that's straight miserable. Thankfully, there are some amazing herbs that can help you with all of that. Just like the herbs inside of Kick-Ass Allergy from Wish Garden Herbs, one of my absolute favorite herbal companies out there. Kick-Ass Allergy, yes, I said ask without the K at the end. Anyways, this formula has yerba santa, nettles, echinacea for that immune support, and orange peels, all which come together to help dry up those excessive mucosal secretions. Yep, I'm talking about the sniffles and the stuffy nose, the watery eyes, and all that jazz. This blend also acts as a great expectorant and can help ease the swelling and inflammation in those mucosal tissues. It is a top go-to for seasonal allergies. And get this, they combine all those beautiful herbs with glycerin, so it actually tastes pretty darn good. Or should I say it tastes kick ass without the K at the end. Anyways, if allergy season is miserable for you and you want a natural remedy that actually works for those itchy eyes and being all sneezy and wheezy, you have got to check out Wish Garden Herbs Kick Ask Allergy. And for those of you with the little kiddos, no sweat, they've got a kick it allergy too. And you pregnant mamas? You don't have to suffer either. They've got a kick-ass allergy formula just for you. So head over to wishgardenherbs.com or check out the link in the show notes and go grab yourself some kick-ass allergy so you can enjoy spring again. Yeah, so... It really is a challenge for so many. And what I see is that when people feel supported, then they have fewer mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. So whether that's having going out and finding the groups of people that they enjoy being around, whether that's getting outside every single day with your baby. I've heard a lot of people on my podcast say that, that they just needed to take a walk in the morning and in the evening, every single day with their baby, no matter what, or without their baby, whether that's finding the one night a week when you're going to leave the house and go sit in a coffee shop or go do yoga or, you know, just be by yourself and sit in a park or I don't know, just do something where you're alone. I found grocery shopping alone to be luxurious in my first few years. I'm like, oh, she's still alone this is great right I hate to name that as one because like care tasks for the family should not be considered me time but like you know if that's all you can manage then great do it alone and insist that you don't take the baby um but just finding those small things that remind you that you are a person outside of your baby and that Mm -hmm. your whole life is not dependent on milk supply. Mm -hmm. Um, And remembering if you're in those early days of milk production, that the learning curve of breastfeeding is steeper, but then it feels better once you get to the, to the, where it flattens out. Mm -hmm. So, um, for a lot of people, at least. Right. Sometimes you struggle with pain for three and a half years. Yeah. But even for (laughs) me, you know, I was struggling, but at least I wasn't, I wasn't in that place where you can't find positions and you don't know how to hold your baby and, you don't know when your baby's hungry or you don't know why your baby's crying. Like all of that stuff in the beginning where it all feels like a mystery, that stuff kind of resolves. 
And the thing you said about doing the research, I think that ties into how mothers feel supported because I am somebody, I love to listen to podcasts. That's why I started one myself. I love to read books, but I have had to learn over the years That if I'm reading something and it's feeling like I'm going to have to change my whole way of doing something, then it's not the right resource for me. Mm -hmm. But if I'm reading something and I'm feeling like, oh, yeah, I could incorporate this nugget or that nugget into what I'm already doing, then it is the right resource for me. And so sometimes we feel like in order to make things work for us, we have to or in order to see change, we have to like completely disrupt our lives instead of feeling like, you know what, in order for me to feel better, I could make one small change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think that's the same. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that is so important because again, it, it gets really overwhelming if you dig into the research and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to change everything. And in that moment of reading it, you might be like, I'm going to do this. And then the very next day you're like, I didn't do that. And it may lead to like feelings of shame or failure or Mm -hmm. doubt or fear or I'm doing it all wrong Mm -hmm. as so often comes to mom. So I like that tip that that it, it goes like back to the topic of balance, you know, little shifts here and little shifts there can make a whole world of difference. Yeah. And I think if somebody's really struggling and they need to feel supported, they can think about what is my next right step? What's one area that I'm struggling most that I can change? So if Mm -hmm. it's like nighttime breastfeeding, um, is there one window that I could get a little more sleep in um, instead of thinking about the whole nighttime, for instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So what would you recommend for somebody struggling with nighttime feeding? Is there, I mean, I know it's going to be different situationally, but something maybe broadly approached. (laughs) Yeah. So I think it is, you know, it's very, very individual, but I think somebody has to ask themselves, especially if they're struggling with mental health and, and they really think that their lack of sleep is having an impact on their mental health, because one of the reasons, and this is, this is the big theme of my podcast is that one of the reasons breastfeeding is so difficult is because we are not supported to breastfeed. So, Mm -hmm. so many times people walk away from their baby feeding experience thinking I failed or my body failed. And the reality of the situation is you did not fail you were failed by a society and a culture that does not support women to breastfeed their babies. Yeah. So anthropologically speaking, we were not one mother and one partner in an isolated household trying to take care of just their children. We were large social groups where everybody helped everybody to keep the babies alive. There were aloe mothers who fed each other's babies. There were every baby had between anywhere between six and 12 um, primary caregivers who fed the babies from their own milk who carried the babies around, who tended to them when they needed care. And so now we have one, maybe two primary caregivers, but often the primary caregiving is being left to the the mother of a heterosexual relationship. Mm-hmm. So, so there, it is no wonder that so many of us struggle with breastfeeding because that is not the way humans evolved to feed human milk to babies. And so I always like to remind people that, that if you are struggling, it is not you that have failed. And if you need to say to yourself, listen, I am struggling so much. We did not evolve to feed babies in this way. I need more sleep because I don't have six to 12 other primary caregivers that are helping me to care for this baby. So I am going to sacrifice milk supply so that I can be a healthier, happier 
parent during the day, I am going to make sure I get one six hour window every single night. And my partner is going to feed the baby. Um, then do that. Mm -hmm. And we know that if we skip that feeding and we don't pump milk supply will most likely reduce. We know mm -hmm. that. However, we also know that having a parent who is happy and healthy and present with their children is in the long term better for those children than exclusively having breast milk. And I am a breast milk advocate. I love breast milk. I have centered my whole career around it. But what I love more are moms who feel happy and supported. Yeah. Amen. And so, you know, in this modern world where we are not supported to feed our babies, sometimes the better choice is to say, okay, you know what? It, I'm not being supported to do this. And so I am going to make this other choice because that's what's going to make me be able to support my children better. So Absolutely. that's one example that sometimes I help my clients come to those decisions. Like it's not the end of the world. You know, we worry about the microbiome, of course, like we hear all this stuff as breastfeeding mothers and we take it very, very seriously. Of course we all do. And in the end, they all end up eating goldfish off the floor, you know, like most mm -hmm. of them do. <laughs> Shh, secrets out. <laughs> I did so good for the first three and a half years of my child's life. And she had to go to preschool for a moment. And I remember she came home with Kit Kats and things. And I was like, what I know. <laughs> like, it is that nothing but like wholesome amazing all the you know all the perfect things that a mom could strive for and then yeah goldfish on the floor <laughs> yeah yeah so there are things that are more important sometimes and yeah. and so like for sleep now that is not going to be the thing I recommend for everybody because for right. some people exclusively breastfeeding is really important. So for those people, I might recommend, is there a way to safely sleep with your baby? Because you are going to get more sleep if your baby is in the bed with you. So are, is there a way to make an arrangement where you can do that? Um, if that's not the case, you know, is there some other problem solving we can do? Is there any possible way you can hire a night nanny who can bring the baby to you? do for feedings mm -hmm. or can your partner be up for a certain amount of time bring the baby to you for feedings and then put the baby down like or can they do that a couple of nights a week you know like there are adjustments that can be made and I actually have two episodes about this on my mm -hmm. on my podcast so um maybe you can we can chat about that and I'll link to them in the show notes if you want to you probably don't have the number or anything off, off the top of your head right now but top of my head no. yeah we'll get it linked in the show notes for sure um because that would be great for people to listen to and learn about I was really fortunate I, I mean I, I slept with my baby and that's how we breastfed throughout the night I just remember being able to lean over and be like fine <laughs> and then still doze off yeah, <laughs> but that's not for everybody yeah and I know um quite a few uh infant sleep specialists who are supportive of breastfeeding who I could refer people to and I trust them I've built relationships mm -hmm. with them and so if if they're feeling like you know what I am at this place where I just need more sleep, that might be the next right step for that family. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that they would be somebody I would refer out to. Like it's all about, about that support network. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I know that a large part of the reason many mothers choose to breastfeed is nourishment, right? It's so important. And what a great way to nourish your newborn baby. I want to talk a little bit about also nourishing mama during that time and some of the more ideal things one can be. Also, as an herbalist, I always understand, and you may want to preface this too, it's going to be unique for everybody. Um, so, but there are certainly some things that are like, yes, this is incredibly nourishing for you and also nourishing for the baby because it does take so many calories from the body and 
yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I I love when people ask this question. I find it so interesting. And what I love even more is when I talk to people from across the globe, mm. because people from other countries answer this question differently. Ooh, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. And I have had people on my podcast from India. I've had people on my podcast from Australia. I've had people on my podcast from the Philippines, from um, somebody who was from the Ukraine, I believe, Romania, but living in uh, Great Britain. So uh, you know, it's interesting because when you talk to people, there are cultural foods, which they believe nursing families, nursing mothers should be eating. And I always start with this when people ask me that question, because there are no hard and fast rules about what anyone should be eating while nursing. Right. Um, and it's funny because when you go on all the Facebook groups that are, you know, breastfeeding groups and someone's like, what should I eat to increase my milk supply? Or what should I be eating while I'm nursing? Somebody will say, oh, definitely eat this, definitely eat that. And, you know, I always say, if you want to eat that and you like to eat that, great, eat your little heart out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and also like, there's really not a lot of evidence to say that you should eat anything in particular. Now, we do know that you should definitely be eating and drinking to thirst. Um, you know, there's a lot of numbers out there about how much water you should be drinking. There's no specific amount, but you do need a lot of water to make milk. Mm -hmm. And we know that if you're, if you're feeling thirsty, then you're definitely not drinking enough water. So make sure that you're drinking to thirst. Um, and as far as the foods that you should be eating, just lots of whole foods, lots of foods that are rich in vitamins and minerals. However, I don't like to put pressure on anybody in the postpartum period. Mm. I like to tell people, do the best you can because humans have evolved to make milk for their babies in quite dire circumstances. And there is a lot of anthropological da data to show that the reason that it, it's, it's that mammals have evolved to feed their babies in this way is because it does not deplete the parent nutritionally to feed milk to the baby and it's very flexible. So if the parent is in an environment where it's not nutritionally rich, they're still able to feed the baby and they can feed the baby for a long time and they don't need a lot of access to food like like parents in in environments where there are famines can breastfeed their babies and produce enough milk for them. Um, and so we can take that pressure off of ourselves to feel like we have to eat the perfect foods. I like that. What do you, I would love to hear your take on this um, as an herbalist. Yeah. You know, I also agree that it's going to be different for each person. Some people do have religious dietary guidelines. Some people have allergy dietary guidelines. I'm a huge fan of whole foods as much as you possibly can. I like to say eat the rainbow and not Skittles. Try and get <laughs> what feels good and tastes good into your body. I think during this time, it's so important to to recognize that you're doing your best and you're going to make it through this really, really, really challenging time. I also look to herbs that are very, very nourishing. So I recommend that mamas are drinking a ton of nettles and red raspberry leaf mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. strengthen and tone the uterus. Both of those also, especially nettles, have great galactagog properties. So that means they're going to increase the milk flow. So I turn to that immediately and then I am a meat eater. 
I also choose to eat meat that is raised without hormones and antibiotics and locally raised, which can definitely be a huge financial impact for yeah. a lot of people, um, for me included, but I made that choice. Like if I'm going to eat meat, I'm going to eat really high quality and nourishing meat. And that meant I had to sacrifice in other ways with money for sure. Um, so Yes, it is unique to everyone. I know when I was breastfeeding, I really loved some big, full, nourishing meals and sweet potatoes. I loved a lot because they filled me up so much. Um, but yeah, I, I always recommend a lot of a lot of great wholesome herbs and getting them into the body as much as possible. Things like dandelion leaf, fantastic. Um, and I could I could talk about herbs all lifelong I do like you talk about breast milk all lifelong yes, yes. so um I'm always a huge fan as well of nourishing herbs that support a mama's nervous system so something along the lines of milky oat tops oat mm. straw in and itself is going to be incredibly mineral and vitamin rich where the milky oat tops are going to support and tone the entire nervous system and help that mama feel a little bit more grounded oh wow. that's so important yeah. yeah absolutely so those are some of the things I I look to instantly and I I'm I am not a proponent of one diet fits the world <laughs> I yeah. know there's so many people that preach it out online and it's and even outside of the world of breastfeeding like that's it's not yes. how our bodies work. There is no one diet fits all, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. fascinating. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, you mentioned red raspberry leaf and I just learned something about red raspberry leaf that I did not know before. Have you ever heard of Raynaud syndrome? Yes. So Raynaud syndrome for anyone who hasn't heard of it is um, it's something that impacts uh, lots of people, but specifically anyone who has Renauds, they tend to have a lot of pain, especially in the cold months while breastfeeding because Renauds, it, uh, impacts the, um, like the digits, toes, fingers, and nipples. And so what will happen is there will be a lot of pain, um, maybe not necessarily during breastfeeding, but after, um, and, I just read recently that it is helpful. Red raspberry leaf can be helpful in relieving symptoms of Raynaud, Raynaud syndrome. Have you heard this before? I, not off the top of my head. It could be one of those things that I read long ago and just kind of let it, let it go. But I'm really interested and would love for you to share that, those studies and that data with me so I can look into it. It doesn't surprise me though. Yeah, I just I saw it on um an article about Galactagogs, um uh herbal Galactagogs and red raspberry leaf of course is known already to be an herbal Galactagog and then it was just mentioned that it also helps with Renauds. I don't know what studies there are but um Sometimes there's none and it's just anecdotal evidence. Right, exactly. So yeah. that's yeah. that's the, the challenge we have in this world of herbal medicine and and yeah. But and life. you know, Renaud's <laughs> impact so many people. It might have been what was impacting me during my mm -hmm. nursing journey, although I don't think it was the only thing. And so to know that there could be something that is helpful. I'm not sure if that would be uh, taken in a tincture or in a, a, a tea. I know a tea is a great way to get a lot of the nourishment out of red raspberry um, because a tincture is alcohol based. They don't, the alcohol doesn't extract the minerals and vitamins mm -hmm. as you would get in, in a tea form. So okay. that kind of stuff is really important to know. You could get other medicinal benefits out of the plant, but if you're really seeking the nourishment, you want to look to another route. You could also choose a vinegar and infuse it in a vinegar and use it as a salad dressing and things along those lines. So um, maybe jazz it up with some other herbs that are really, really tasty. Oh, cool. That could be helpful. So let, let's talk about herbs, you know, herbs and lactation. Do you ever, do you share herbs with your clients and, and what kind of herbs can a mama look to? from the lactation consultant perspective? 
Yeah. So a lot of times we get asked about herbs for increasing milk supply or decreasing milk supply. Mm -hmm. Um, So if somebody's weaning, then we'll get asked about herbs. And if it's just, um, if it's just a quick conversation, then of course I'll send them to known resources online or I'll say, here's a list. You can look through these and see what you think. But I always preface this conversation by saying, if you are having, if you're just like, oh, what can I take to, to try to increase my supply? Everything's going well. I just want to know if, if, if there's anything that might help, then great. You like look and, you know, play around with, with herbs, go to an herbalist and see what can help, of course. <laughs> However, if you are really struggling with milk supply, if there are weight gain issues with your baby, if your baby is dropping off their curb, if you are in any pain at all, if there are latch difficulties, if your baby is extremely fussy at the breast, coming on and off the breast frequently, this would be an issue where it is not going to be solved by galactagogues alone. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, because milk production, uh, an increasing milk production is really done by removing enough milk from the breast. So uh, milk production happens by autocrine hormonal control. And so that means it's all happening by the hormones are controlled by what happens actually at the breast, not by anything we take. And so if that, if the, if the, if enough milk is not being drained from the breast, then there is not the hormonal signal happening in the pituitary gland to create more milk. So if that doesn't get resolved, I don't care how much of any herb you take, you are not going to get to the root cause as mm-hmm. we were talking about. So I just it's have all about to the preface root. it. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just have to preface it with that. Um, but there are the, the most commonly the most common herb that we hear talked about in the in lactation world when it comes to milk supply is fenugreek. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and- talk about fenugreek for a moment from a lactation consultant's perspective. I know there's a few groups on social media that say, don't ever take fenugreek. Ah, yeah. So fenugreek, it's funny because for a while, anytime there was a lactation issue, fenugreek was just be thrown at it. And so I think there was kind of like a response, like a response, like, Hey, like, let's slow down the use of fenugreek because it's not going to solve every lactation problem, but it's been used around the world for centuries as a galactagogue. Um, And it has been known to increase milk production. There are studies that have shown that it can increase milk production. Um, it also does lower blood sugar levels. And so we do have to be careful, uh, if anybody is on a strict insulin regimen. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important to work with somebody like an herbalist. If, um, if you have any other, uh, medical issues that you're working on, it isn't, um, recommended for use during pregnancy. So it's not something that you would want to start taking before, uh, like to try to get your milk production going Mm -hmm. before you had your baby. Um, Ah, and the other thing that I uh, wanted to say about fenugreek was that the reason I had not learned this, but maybe you knew about it was that it has been suggested that fenugreek may affect milk production because the breast is a modified sweat gland Hmm. and fenugreek um has been known to um increase uh sweat production and so it could be that it's working in that way have you heard this before i haven't but i'm really intrigued and now want to dive a little bit deeper into it for sure but would that then mean that all what something that causes you to sweat is called called a diaphoretic herb would that mean that all of our diaphoretic herbs are going to promote greater milk flow? Yeah, I don't really know. Um, that is just one theory that has been thrown around. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, it 
And the other thing is that it can be discontinued once mm -hmm. milk production has reached an appropriate level, but it's also safe to use long term. Right. Um, but it has to be used in pretty high levels. And so you walk around smelling like maple syrup. Yeah. I'm sweating Wait. fenugreek all day, <laughs> yeah. which I guess for many is better than smelling like garlic all day. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, uh, yeah, people use it in teas and they yeah. often mix it with fennel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to, when I ran my herbal product line, I had three herbal teas that I made specifically for moms. And one of them was called the Milk Ladies Blend because mm -hmm. um, my mom always said I came from the Milk Lady because she has short with dark hair and dark skin and dark eyes. And I'm none of those. So <laughs> she was like, you came from the Milk Lady. So when That's I... so funny. Yeah, when I came up with that, that particular product... Um, that had to be the name for it. So, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it was good. But I did use fenugreek and I used fennel in that particular blend. So I just yeah. wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. And there was re one researcher who reported the use of fenugreek in 1,200 women under her care who increased their milk supply in 24 to 72 hours. Oh, that's impressive. That was Huggins. That's really, really fast. I wonder in what fashion they were taking. Do, do you have the, the study in front of you? Like what? I don't have the study in front of me. I do That's not. okay. No. Cool. Cool. More insight from low, more insight from low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could send you the study. I do have it linked here. So. Um, cool. Any other herbs that you... Yeah. Fancy. So an, yeah. <laughs> another one that I thought was interesting. Do you um do any uh I always say this word wrong, Ayurvedic? Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurvedic um medicine? this is really great because I had another mom on the podcast who I have known for years. We both used she had an uh, a ghee company. She mm. infused really great herbs with ghee and I was oh, running my, right. my product line and we would always run into each other at natural product expos and all the places. And she was just on the podcast a few months ago. And, um, she is also an Ayurvedic practitioner. And I brought up the, like, well, let's talk about what's the difference between like I'm a Western herbalist and she's Ayurvedic and really there's no difference in the herbs. They're all the same herbs that we're using. It's more the system of how we talk about energetics and oh. um, different aspects of the body and the plant and things. Along oh, so those fascinating. Lines. That doesn't yeah. surprise me at all though. I mean, I feel like this, oh, sorry. That's a Google calendar alert. Oh, I didn't even hear it. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, good. I only heard it in my ears. Um, yeah, I feel like it's often the same plants that you hear coming up again and yeah. again. Um, yeah, so there's an herb called Shadavari. Mm -hmm. Do, are you familiar with this herb? I sure am. <laughs> and what I love about this one is that it's known as herbal domperidone. Have you ever heard of domperidone? No. Okay, so domperidone is a pharmaceutical which is used um a ton in Canada by a breastfeeding expert called Dr. Jack Newman mm -hmm. and it is not used in the United States because it is not um FDA approved for increasing milk production um mm -hmm. and raglan is more commonly used here for increasing milk production the problem is Raglan often can lead to um, lots of side effects, including postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And whereas domperidone, there really aren't a lot of other side effects, um, especially at the dosage used for increasing milk production. And so when somebody has done all the right things and they can't figure out why they're not increasing milk supply, it is a great pharmaceutical. But I love this idea of knowing that there is an herb that could potentially do the same thing and it's not a pharmaceutical mm -hmm. and it's known to kind of it's called it, it's it's known to increase the vital fluids in the body mm -hmm. as you probably know mm -hmm. and and breast milk is a vital fluid that gets created in the body and so it's really known to kind of help 
um, get things flowing. And it's also used often with fertility. And so it's a really great choice for people who are nursing, but are also trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, so I really liked this one. Uh, I really like this one based on the fact that it's known as herbal domperidone, which I love that. And there's this piece of me that's like, as the herbalist, and I hear so many people on social media, this is the herbal XYZ pharmaceutical. Right. I know, right? <laughs> right, I know. And I hate to break it to the thousands of people that do that. It's right. Not, not exactly how it works, but you right. can certainly look to many herbs to support the body in, right. in many, many ways. And Shatavari is fantastic. So, right. And if you can um, use Shatavari and try it and see if it does get things flowing, um, and especially because Domperidone will not be prescribed to you, most likely if you are in the United States, right. Um, then great. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about pharmaceuticals and prescription drugs or over-the-counter ones during lactation mm -hmm. um, and how to approach that or consider it and think about it because obviously there's certainly times when it's absolutely necessary and what I know about herbs and breastfeeding and pharmaceuticals is that there's a huge lack of studies and resources that show safety and or efficacy and it can become such a struggle to navigate and the other thing, I'm just going to blanket this really quickly, that is very, very true in the world of herbalism and breastfeeding is that when you look online, they'll say everything is not safe during breastfeeding. And more often than not, this is coming from the evidence of herbs causing uterine contractions during pregnancy which is not safe during pregnancy. And then that automatically is thrown to that particular herb for breastfeeding. So that's a little yeah. different subject than the pharmaceutical piece, but I just want to pop that yeah, in there. Well, I think my answer can apply to both pharmaceuticals and to herbs mm -hmm. because um, well, many, many, many drugs and herbs are safe to use while breastfeeding. And it always makes me feel very sad when I hear that somebody is not seeking out the health care they need or has been suggested to them because they are breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. um, because as I mentioned earlier, we need to make sure that both mom and baby are well cared for. It, you are a dyad. It's not just the needs of the baby that matter during mm -hmm. breastfeeding. And, um, and so the person, the primary researcher across the world who has, who lo has looked into the safety of breastfeeding, um, drugs and breastfeeding or any substances, including herbs is Dr. Hale. And he is a researcher, uh, out of Texas, actually, he lives in Amarillo, Texas, and he has, uh, he is the one who created the infant risk center that you can call and ask, is this safe? And he um, has a, he created an app for professionals where we can look up any drug and we can kind of, he has a rating system. And so we can see based on his rating system, how many studies there are, uh, if it's rated a one, it means absolutely, totally safe. If it's a five, it means it is contraindicated. Um, this, this drug not only gets into the breast milk, but it is unsafe for the baby once it gets into the breast milk. And there are various factors used to determine safety for the baby and how it gets into the breast milk. So the, the kinds of factors that we're looking at are the molecular weight of the drug, um, the, um, the protein binding. So whether or not it's able to bind to a protein tells us whether or not it will actually get into the breast milk. Um, 
we are looking at um I'm I'm forgetting all the factors off the top of my head, but there's a variety of factors that that help us to determine whether or not that substance can get into the breast milk. So mm-hmm. sometimes there is a substance that even though it is a medication um, that you are uh, taking, it it just cannot pass into the breast milk. It's physiologically impossible for it to pass mm-hmm. into the breast milk. So it is 100% safe. It's going to be rated a one. Other times, um, the molecular weight of the breast milk is very small for, of the drug is very small, for instance. And so it is going to pass into the breast milk. Oh, the, um, the half-life. So Mm -hmm. the half-life of the drug means if it has a very long half-life, it is going to stay in your breast milk for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to impact the baby for a long time. So sometimes we'll say you can have that, but take it right after you feed the baby and then don't feed the baby for another two to three hours. Mm -hmm. So because we know it's going to be out of your blood and therefore out of your milk by the time you feed the baby again. It's why we say with alcohol, for instance, it's fine to drink, but if you are feeling um, incapacitated by drinking, then you know that that's how much that you should not be feeding the baby because it is, that's how much is in your um, milk as well, because whatever is in your bloodstream is also in your milk. Whereas Mm -hmm. if you drink, but you're not feeling anything, then there is so little in your milk that it's not going to impact the baby. Mm -hmm. Does that answer make sense? It does for sure. And there's so many variables and it's greater proof of the importance of working with professionals in those fields. So you don't have to go bonkers trying to navigate that and you can have somebody do it for you. And then you yeah. can take time to focus on you and your well-being and, yeah. and, and there all are, of the other things. Yeah. And if you, there are definitely, and I can give you the information for the infant risk center because you can just call them and say, mm-hmm. Hey, I need to take this medication. Um, is it okay? And usually right. if you ask your pediatrician, what they're looking at is the drug insert information. They are not looking at Dr. Hale's information. And so the drug insert information is always going to err on the side of no, probably. That's why when you go to the dentist, they're like, oh yeah, you have to pump and dump for 24 hours because they don't actually know anything about the safety of the medication based on these factors that I've described. Right. Um, Yeah. What a great resource. That is, that is fantastic. Um, I think that you and I could discuss these kinds of things for a very, very long long time. time. Um, Let us wrap it up a bit. I really want to make sure that um, our listeners know how to find you and can tune into your podcast. And if they want to work with you as a consultant, like drop it on us. How do we find you and all those pieces? Awesome. Thank you so much. So my podcast is called The Milk Making Minutes. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, And it's also on YouTube, not every single episode, but I now the most recent episodes you can watch. So if you prefer to watch, you can. And you can find me for lactation consultations at www.quabinbirthservices.com. I'm sure you can link that in the show notes for of anyone course. <laughs> who thinks what is Quabin. Uh, and, <laughs> like I did before yeah. we recorded. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's a it's a local reservoir. And um, I would love to do prenatal consultations with anyone or anyone who is struggling with breastfeeding. I actually have a consultation tomorrow with somebody who it just has a lot of questions about weaning. They're 16 month old. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, there are all sorts of breastfeeding questions from this, from before you conceive till years down the line. And so I would love to be the person who answers those questions for you. Um, I can meet in person and virtually. I love that. And before we go, I would love for you, like, I know this is a 
big question, but for any mom who is listening and thinking of, I mean, this is a big question, thinking about anything regarding breastfeeding, what is one incredibly valuable piece of info info you would share beyond all of the incredible value you've already shared? <laughs> mm. Yeah. Just some words of wisdom or something. Yeah. I would tell anybody who is thinking about feeding a baby from their body, has fed a baby from their body, has tried to feed a baby from their body, that your motherhood and your ability to mother is not defined by that. And Yay. I'm sorry. I, I love that piece. Yeah. Yeah. Because so much gets wrapped up in that. And I celebrate every ounce you made. And I mourn with you if you weren't able to do it. Um, but also, I recognize that however you fed your baby, that was the right choice for your family. Mm -hmm. And you are still a great mom. You are a great mom. There's no still in it. Um, and yeah, 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 the way you mother, um, is amazing and it has nothing to do with the way you fed your baby. I love that. And it's so, so true and so incredibly important. So I, what a beautiful way to end the show. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Have a great day, Lo. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of The Herbalist Path. Being on this journey with you is absolutely incredible. If you dig this episode, please leave me a review on your favorite podcast player and share it with your friends so that together we can make herbalism hashtag spread like wildflowers. On another note, I must mention that while I know you're getting some good info here, it's important to remember that this podcast is purely for entertainment and educational purposes and is not intended to be a substitute for medical treatment. While the information in this podcast is absolutely relevant, herbs work differently for each person and each condition. That's why I recommend you work with a qualified practitioner, whether that be another herb herbalist, a naturopath, or your doctor. So thank you again. I am truly honored that you're tuning into these episodes and on the path with me to make sure that there's an herbalist in every home again. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends so that we can make herbalism. Hashtag spread like wildflowers. It has been so much fun and so, I don't know, joyous watching all of my medicinal plant friends popping up in my garden from the Alicampane to the Comfrey and the Arnica. I love seeing these friends pop up. And if you are still trying to decide what to grow in your medicinal herb garden, you've got to grab my guide. It's all about the most essential herbs that every mom should know and should grow. So I teach you how to grow them and the many different ways that you can use them. If you want to grab the guide, go ahead. It's free and I'm pretty sure you're going to get a lot of delight and use out of it. And there's a link to it in the show notes. I'm wishing you tons of happy medicine planting.